Okay, we'll just go ahead and get started and we'll try and see how things go. So my apologies for that struggle at the beginning. Um, my name is Lynn Crump. I'm a Department of Conservation and Recreation Administrator for our Virginia Scenic Rivers Program. And today my intention is to talk about what the program is, a little bit about its history, some of the benefits of it, and then actually have you all work with me to go through an evaluation. So in order to do that, if you'll see on your um, opportunities, there's handouts for this session and you can download them or you can wait and we'll go through them together. But uh, you may wanna do that if not now, then later. And I have some links in there as well as the criteria for our evaluations. Um, but before we get too far along, I would like to go ahead and play this video for you. And... Today, we're evaluating the York. <sighs> oh, so sorry. Today, we're evaluating the York River at the request of York and Gloucester counties for scenic river designation. Helping us today are representatives from the Waterman's Museum, Gloucester and York Counties, and the Community Design Assistance Center at Virginia Tech, as well as VIMS. Our team will be on two boats, one of which is the Schooner Serenity. miles and what we've seen is a fairly pristine river with the uh, a lot of the shoreline protected by federal and state easements and uh, lands. about actually going to those spaces, working with um, locals, working with people who actually know these waterways and trying to figure out the kind of the relationships that, and the relationships to the water and the water course um, that we can't um, glean from just our data. gives you a brief overview. We'll go into this in more depth today, but the history of the Scenic Rivers Program actually started in 1965 with the beginning of Virginia's Commonwealth, which was the statewide land conservation and recreation plan. As many of you may be aware, there is uh, the 
outdoor recreation plans that are required by each state if they're going to receive land and water conservation funds. Those plans are updated every five years, and for most of those, Scenic Rivers has been mentioned in one way or another. But the true start of our program was in 1970 when it was codified, and the codification came after this 1969 report called Virginia Scenic Rivers, where it identified approximately 28 river segments to be considered for designation, as well as outlining what the criteria would be for designation. Our uh, General Assembly, as I mentioned, um, has the special chapter and act, and that stayed in effect as was until 2003, when there was a major update. Up until two 2003, it was required for each scenic river to have a local committee that was appointed by our governor to manage and, and, um, and watch the river and make sure it was done well. A lot of those appointments uh, were people that did not necessarily have a vested interest in the local, local river. And also because of time, a lot of the major enthusiasts for the rivers had gone away. So they decided to eliminate all of the local committees and create one statewide committee. There were three committees that decided they wanted to stay in effect. The historic falls of the James in Richmond and Goose Creek, and then later Catoctin Creek in Loudoun County. And then in 2012, that statewide committee was abolished and the responsibilities of that were given to the Board of Conservation and Recreation. Right now we have 37 river segments that have been designated and approximately 166 miles of river designated. A lot of people would say that sounds like an awful lot of rivers, but we have 49,000 river miles in Virginia. As you can see from this, a lot of them we still pay attention to. This Virginia Outdoors Plan of 2018 had a big segment on the rivers and identified significant rivers that people were still interested in designating. As was mentioned in the video and prior to this, it is a locally driven program and therefore it requires local endorsement and supervision of the process. This is a map of our state with our local rivers that are designated. It does not have the two most recent ones, um, but it shows all the others in dark blue that have been designated. And you can see that they are coastal rivers, Piedmont rivers, and mountain rivers. And each one of those river areas um, have like commonalities, but comparing mountain rivers to coastal rivers is not something we do within this program. In 2020, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of our Scenic Rivers program. Many of you may be aware, one of the reasons that we had focused on Virginia for this symposium was because we were gonna have you all help us celebrate the 50th anniversary. That didn't happen, we're now doing it virtually. But I do wanna go over some of the things that we did accomplish with that. We had a, a, the first ever photographic spread in one of our statewide magazines with a detailed online report about what was happening in the Scenic Rivers program. We had approximately 10,000 uh, coasters that were distributed by 13 different folks throughout our Commonwealth to local breweries, cideries, and wineries. We had a film night that we did in conjunction with one of our NGOs to talk about the river program. And this um, instigated the extension of the Rappahannock designation, which was quite an uh, accomplishment and a celebrated success. Our marketing folks at DCR created a special 50th anniversary page, which you can go to at this link if you'd like to. And our governor proclaimed Virginia uh, June as Virginia Scenic Rivers Month in 2020. We have over 70,000 organic social media impressions and um, 12 earned media stories related to scenic rivers over the last year. We also had this wonderful gallery exhibit, which unfortunately was not seen by as many people as we had hoped, that had 13 panels and a circulating loop of video that we used to tell about the program. And this was in Richmond, and we're hoping to have it go across the state at smaller local museums. The other thing that happened is we had some interns that were done by the Piedmont Environmental Council, 
and through the Virginia Commonwealth University students that created some story maps for us. And these are those story maps. And as I mentioned, there's the handout that gives you the links to these so you can go and actually experience them. So let's talk a little bit about the program and, and what it means and how it is uh, conducted. So the program's purpose is a commitment to resource protection, but not to keep development from happening, but to accommodate necessary use and development in a way that does not detract from the scenic criteria of the rivers. The benefits of the program is based on what the communities are looking for when they do it. Since the focus of the program is to uh, recognize and designate rivers that have superior natural scenic beauty, fish and wildlife, and historic, recreational, geologic, cultural, and other assets. Some of the benefits that are provided by this is the consideration for scenic resources and planning and design. And even though there are multiple dozen references to scenic in the Virginia Code, the Scenic Rivers Code is the only one that actually is codified. It requires the General Assembly to authorize any new dam construction. And this is the only regulation that is associated with this code. So this is a recognition code that localities use for their own purposes. It does provide for continued riparian land uses, and it also enc encourages closer review for projects by state, federal, and local agencies when they're doing permitting. Oops. I wanna go back to this picture um, and I'd like to see if any of you all have, can raise your hand if you know where this is. It is in Virginia and it is one of our designated scenic rivers. Is there anybody out there raising hands? One. <laughs> Risa, that's a cheating. Anyway, this is the Russell Fork. It is a designated scenic river, as I mentioned but it is also a thousand foot deep gorge in Virginia on the Kentucky boundary. Um, it has uh, world-class rapids on it and it's a really fabulous place to go and well worth considering. And one of my favorite places, which is why I always have to include a photograph on it. So the other thing I'd like to do is for you all to take a minute in the chat box and tell me which states you're aware of that have state scenic river programs in them. And I'm hoping Angie will uh, read to me from the chat box because I can't see it. This is Joni and I see uh, Washington State, Oklahoma and South Carolina. Thank you. Um, okay, as if any of you have seen any of the previous conversation that Risa had, there were used to be a lot more of them. And I think the river programs have gone by the wayside over the years. But this chart here is a simple um, chart that, that highlights some of the major differences between wild and scenic program, which is a federal program, and the Virginia program. Um, the wild and scenic program has a lot more management associated with it than we do with the Virginia Scenic Rivers program, and they are often confused. Um, a lot of times people will think, for instance, the New River, which many people are aware of, it's designated, has parts designated in West Virginia and North Carolina, but not in Virginia. Um, and so I just wanted to take a minute to show people this um, comparison. So let's talk about the process for designation. It begins at the local level, as I mentioned earlier. And it doesn't happen unless there's a request from a locality for an evaluation to be considered for designation. And the request has to come through the local, um, the local government. So it could be from 
the Board of Supervisors, the City Council, the, the Mayor, the Town Council Administrator, the County Administrator, um, but someone who has a position in the local, local government will send a request to the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Before we will consider doing an evaluation, we have to make sure that the river segment they're interested in meets the minimum standards. And the minimum standards we'll talk about in just a minute. And then once that is met, then we do an evaluation and make a determination about designation. The minimum standard requirements is it has to be a minimum of five miles long and it has to be accessible within that, unless it's a tributary to a designated river. It has to be recognized in Virginia canoeing guides um, and has uh, some sort of public access. And it has to be identifiable beginning and end. Um, early on, we had a couple rivers that said from the headwaters of, and one that's very hard to map because anyone who's familiar with the watershed means there's lots of little tributaries that come down but the other thing is it also makes it very hard to evaluate because we don't necessarily have to be able to paddle the river, but we do have to be able to look at it in a continuous fashion. So does it have a parallel trail? Does it have public um, property access? Does it have a road or some other way that we can actually view it? There's been a lot of discussion about whether or not the evaluations have to be done in person or if they can be done essentially from a desktop. And we're gonna explore that a little further as we go forward here. When we do a field evaluation, um, it's a requirement of the locality to actually support that field work that needs to be done. Right now, I'm the only person in my office that does this. So for, self, for safety reasons and other reasons, as well as the collaborative process that's necessary for doing a scenic designation, I require that there be at least two boats with two people in each boat um, and that the locality plan the trip for us. So um, one thing I forgot to mention early on is all these photographs that you're seeing in this presentation are different designated rivers in Virginia. And this one, if, uh, if you'll remember the conversation this morning, if you came to the keynote speakers, this is a picture of the James River in downtown Richmond. So there are 13 criteria. The film says 14, um, and that's a little bit confusing because of the way our evaluation sheets are written, but there truly are only 13 criteria that actually get a score and a rating that we use as we moving forward. Once we have, um, a confirmation that the, the river can be designated. We then send a letter to the jurisdictions confirming that and requesting their support to move it forward. It is then the responsibility of the locality to contact their local legislators and get them to support and, sh and, sh um, and take a bill through the General Assembly. Once, if they've decided to move forward with that, we will be responsible for doing a report that the General Assembly can then review when they're considering the designation. Um, all of the reports that have been done on designated rivers in the last 10 years are online and you can go onto our website and look at those reports. We also provide them with boilerplate language to be used in the legislation um, and then ask them to uh, work it. If the General Assembly decides that it will designate a scenic river, and that goes through both the House and the Senate. It then goes to the governor for a signature. And we just had two go through that actually were signed on the 30th of March, which will actually go into effect on July 1st. So what I'd like you all to do is to pull out your, your evaluation sheets. And if you didn't pull it out, at least uh, start to take some notes and we're going to go through and see if we can all come up with a, a signature on this. And actually what I'd like to do is to stop sharing this for a second and I'd like to share with you a um,
This is a story map that Dr. Vonish's class did on the Lower Chickahominy Scenic River study. And they did an excellent job of going through the process and moving forward with it. And I'm just going to go through a couple of these pages pretty quickly, just so you can see what is involved, because what we're going to be doing is actually replicating this through our process this afternoon. So they talked about the motivation for the assessment and while we were doing it. They talked about the benefits of designation, which we've, we've gone over already. And they talked about the process. They talked about why uh, scenic rivers are important. And then they have the map that blows up into the segment that's actually being considered, which is from Walker's Dam to uh, Raven's Roost. And we had um, a number, we had all the students go out for two days in the field doing paddling down the river and then we came together and evaluated it and each student was then required to evaluate um, the, uh, the river segment and move forward with it. So I'm just going to run through some of the maps, the history that they did. Oh, we'll skip that one. This had to do with natural fauna, some of the photographs, and uh, history. So I'm going to stop sharing this now, and I'm going to go back to my slide presentation. So this is the segment that we're going to do from Walker's Dam to Rivers Rest Marina. It's approximately 10 miles long. That's an important number for you all to do in your assessment. Okay, come on. Hmm. So the first criteria is riverside vegetation or buffers. What we're looking at is we're looking at how wide are the buffers? And we're very interested in anything that is over 100 feet. That's a predetermined criteria for the evaluation. And so um, that can be looked at through Google Earth or other means. And it just needs to be confirmed in the field. For this segment, it got Approximately 80% was in 100 feet or wider, which would be a score of 30 points. And if you all have any questions as we're going through this, they're being monitored in the chat box, so I can be notified and answer those questions. The next criteria is stream modifications, and this has to do with um, channeling and other kinds of uh, dams and that kind of thing. Since this segment was started below Walker's Dam, which is this is what this photograph is of, we actually give it the full points of 20 points. Human development. Now this one is one that is very difficult to do from a desktop, especially if you have vegetation on, on in full leaf. But it also makes it difficult because we only do our evaluations during full leaf on. And the reason for that is the visual landscape is very different in the winter than it is in the middle of the summer. So we do it in the middle of the summer because that's the peak recreational time, as well as it actually screens a lot of the things that may be developed along the river corridor. And it's made up of two different criteria. The first is whether or not there's a city or town involved. And in the case of this, we actually found that there was quite a bit of development 
um, in big developments in certain sections of the river. So the number of points for the city and town part is zero because it had to be less than 10% of the entire corridor <clears throat> would be undeveloped and there was more than 10%. For the rural development sections, we look at how many houses you see or businesses you see per river mile. And the criteria for the most number of points is zero to 0.5 structures per mile. We had 10 miles of river, so that means you could only have four and a half structures essentially. Otherwise it would be into the next, um, the next lower rating. But because there are sections of this that are highly developed, we actually have zero points for the human development part of this, of this section. Historic features. Now these are all features that are within a thousand feet of the river and they can be of state or national or local interest. And so we did have uh, features that were there. And so you get the full 20 points for that. But this section also had, I mean, this criteria has a bonus point and that states that if there are national or um, state significant structure uh, sites visible from the river, you get extra bonus points. And in this case, there was only one. And so there's a 10 points bonus point. So for the historic, it's all of them or uh, it's 20 points plus 10 points. Landscape variety. This is another one that people try and, and do from a desktop, but is not, it's really not possible. It's really difficult to understand the different variety of the landscape, the elevation changes, the vegetation changes, the direction you're looking and that kind of thing. So the diversity is something that has to be done in the field. The same with the views. You can go into Google Earth, for instance, and do a view shed analysis, but you'll find often that the Google Earth or the GIS will have a much wider view shed than you can actually see when you're in the field and on the river. For both of these criteria, it was 10 points. It was a moderate diversity and a medium range in views. Fisheries and natural heritage. Now fisheries, what we're looking for for that is the quality of the fisheries for recreational purposes. So is this, um, is, the, is fish populations non-existent or are they very robust? Is there a high quality of different opportunities? Is there any national significance to the fisheries? We generally get this information from our, um, wildlife uh, resource folks or from local fishermen who can give us that information. And because of the environment of this river, there were sturgeons that were seen and other things, it is considered a nationally significant fisheries. So that's a full 30 points. There's also extra bonus points for rare and endangered species within a thousand feet of the corridor. This can be um, birds, it can be plants, it can be mussels, it can be fish, it can be all of those things. So for this segment, we had a black rail, maybe salamander, Henslow sparrow, and a loggerhead shrike. So they actually got 40 extra points for the rare and endangered species along this segment of river. Water quality is one oops, let me move on, that a lot of people confuse um, because they think they're looking for benthic and chemical information on this. We remind people that this is about a scenic designation. So we look at turbidity that's caused from high erosion upstream, and we look at the amount of trash on the river. And for this segment, even though this water looks brown, it's actually tannins 
that are coming out of the swamps upstream from this. And there was virtually no erosion that we were, the significant erosion that we saw. And it had um, virtually no trash on the whole segment of river. So it got a full 30 points for this. Parallel roads and crossings. Um, in many cases, this can be a real detriment to the experience on the river, especially if there's a highway of some sort nearby that you can hear or see. Um, and so in this segment, you can see on the map on the left that there's a small section of road that's very close to the river, but it's also a rural road. And in the whole time that we were passing it, we saw one car. So that got the full 30 points. Also, this segment of the river is quite wide and has no bridges across it. So there was 30 points for crossings. Now crossings are not only bridges, they're transmission lines and pipelines. Um, and then if there are uh, trestles from railroads. So all of those are considered crossings. If you're in a smaller riverbed where you have a covered bridge or some sort of historical stone bridge, those kinds of crossings are not taken off your score. They're all, uh, actually um, allowed for it. So I'm getting a notice. Yeah, that we need to sort of finish up quickly. All right, special features is the next one. Um, it, and this has to do with, does it feel remote? It, are there unique cultural sites to see? Is there a change in the variety of the views? Is there um, aquatic beds? Are there wetlands? Is there other kinds of unique features? So all of that has to be experienced when you're in the field and then you get an overall aesthetic appeal for this, and it actually scored at 20, according to the group. There were scores from 10 until 40 on that. So that's why you have a group of people to discuss it and why. You get points for public access, and there are several public access points along, so you get full 10 points for that. And you get points for land protection greater than 25% of the river corridor boundary or the shoreline. And um, this is 28% of the shoreline is protected. That's the pink part. And so you get a full 10 points for that. So I'm gonna give you about two minutes or a minute and a half to add up your scores. And then I would like you all to put your scores in the chat box so we can talk about them. All right, I'm not seeing anybody putting their scores in. So I guess I'll have to share what our score was. So the final score for this section of the Chickahominy River was 250 points. We have a total of approximately 700, I mean, uh, sorry, 378 points total that you can get if you got a perfect score on everything. 
And the way that this program has worked over time, if you get anything higher than a 217, then it does qualify for designation. So this section of the Chickahominy River does qualify for designation. So with that, uh, if we would notify the localities um, that they do qualify, then it's up to them to move it through the General Assembly. This particular section of the Chickahominy, we did not have support from the localities to do the study, um, but we were doing it uh, for the regional planning district who was working on some economic work for that area and did an economic study of the Lower Chickahominy and the benefits that conservation has provided to those communities, which was very interesting because they actually found that for every dollar they invest in land conservation, they actually got more than a dollar back in benefits to the county. So at this point in time, I'm opening it up for any questions, comments, and um, would like to, to know if, there, if anybody has anything they wanna do. I, hopefully you'll be able to use the handouts as you move forward through this process on your own, or maybe if you have questions, you can contact me about those as well. There's my contact information, and that is the website of the Scenic Rivers Program. And through that, you can find a lot of information on the program, why its benefits, how it's conducted, and so forth and so on, as well as links to the reports that we've been doing after the last several years. Um, at this time, I think we have a small enough crowd that if people want to turn off their mics and actually ask me a question, Uh, so I see one is question, can we uh, break down the Chickahominy score? All right, I can do that. So let me go back to the first criteria, which is um, Riverside vegetation. Would it be helpful if I went back on the, maybe it would, maybe it won't, but we can do this this way since we have time. So Riverside vegetation, the total for that, because 80% of it was 100 feet or more in buffer was 30 points. Stream bed modification was a full 20 points because there's no uh, modifications on the section we're doing. Human development was zero points for city or town and zero points for rural development because of the amount of development along the river corridor. Historic features was 20 points for historic sites within a thousand feet of the river's edge and an extra 10 points for a site that was visible from the river um, that had national significance. Landscape variety got a moderate score for the diversity and a moderate, a medium range for views. So each one of those was 10 points each. Fisheries got 30 points and natural heritage got 40 points for the rare and endangered species. Um, and I forgot to tell you that some of the other species along this river segment are eagles, sturgeon, and uh, red knot, which is bird, and long-eared bats. Water quality, just to let you know, uh, again, is not benthic or chemical. It is turbidity and trash, and it got 30 points for that for virtually no litter and low turbidity. Parallel roads and crossings, it had very little parallel roads and no crossings, so got full points for each of those, which was 30 each, so that's another 60. 
special features and overall aesthetic appeal uh, was 20 points. Some of the things that were mentioned of interest are bald cypress, tidal swamps, aquatic beds, seasonal flowering, John Smith Island, steep banks, forest communities, um, and uh, remoteness. Public recreational access was 10 points. There are four recreational access sites along this segment and uh, 10 points for 28% of, of the boundary river's edge being protected. As I mentioned that um, as I added it up was 250 points. If somebody has a different answer, that might be, but as long as it is above 217 points, it, it does qualify for designation. <clears throat> 